Welcome back. Well, last week I did um, a project video on Saturday and a thrifting video on Sunday, mostly because I thought I was going to be able to do a two-part project video, but as it turns out, that just wasn't in the cards. So we are back to our normal setup of doing a thrifting video on Saturday and the project on Sunday. So I'm back into my files from Let's Antiques and pulling out the interesting stuff that I filmed there, but I've never gotten a chance to show you. So that's what we're going to take a look at today when we come back. antiques is a Chinese cabinet and I these are are great the way they make Chinese cabinets is just really interesting because Asian furniture is not the same as European furniture so let's take a look and then we'll talk about it well look at this piece this looks like it's something that has just come in because it's in front of the door. Um, a very Asian look to it. Let's look at our little feet down here. Let's see how that... There we go. Nice, large cabinet space. A lot of these Chinese pieces were restructured from old window shutters, uh, from existing pieces that had totally different purposes. So seeing a large sort of space like this, frankly, isn't all that unusual. Pretty, pretty piece. I really like this. Um, and obviously we don't have a price on it because clearly it just came in, but I will keep you posted. So as I mentioned when I was filming, that piece was probably not originally configured the way you saw it in the film. It's probably something rather different. That large open space probably had some other purpose rather than an open space. Um, some of the things that we take for granted and say, this is ordinary furniture. Uh, these are not things that historically have been found in Asia. Beds, for example. Yes, the Chinese have beds and have for centuries had beds, much the same as our beds. In fact, if anything, I think we may have pulled some stylistic ideas from them over the centuries, but not so in other places in Asia. Uh, Japan, for example, where they have futons, mats that they just roll up in the morning and shove to the side. Very different. They don't have dressers or bureaus. Um, they, they don't have wardrobes. These are things that we sort of, we consider our clothes storage to be um, just very standard. No, no. Uh, they ordinarily will house their clothing in cabinets or on shelves. Um, not the way we do it at all. This whole concept of drawer is very Western. Uh, the Chinese do have cabinets that contain drawers. Um, apothecary cabinets, for example, uh, very popular in China. But these are tiny little drawers that will hold a handful of pencils. It's not the sort of thing where you can fold up a pair of blue jeans and shove it in there. Well, maybe you could, but you'd have to be a doll. So I love seeing 
Asian pieces that have been turned into something useful in Western market. Now, the reason I like this is because, of course, I don't like the idea of wonderful old pieces of furniture being discarded simply because they're no longer utilitarian. So, I would much rather see them remade and reutilized than, you know, carved up for scrap or thrown out, out in a heap to be used as firewood. So, I'm always very intrigued when I see Chinese pieces in particular, but Asian pieces in general, when they've been reconfigured for a Western market. Um, next up, uh, this is a wonderful rug, and it's one of many, many, many rugs that they have over at Lutz's. So let's take a look. We've talked about this before. They get a lot of really nice rugs in here. Large, older pieces. Let's take a look at this. $4.95. Um, 9.6 by 13.6 is going to be in either the 9 by 12 uh, classification or the 10 by 15. Um, Rugs like this are never perfect sizes, and as a consequence, they, they fall into what is called a class size. So an 8x10 rug might be 7.5 feet by 10 feet 3 inches. It's still in that general class size. This one, this one is a very pretty looking rug. That is a good price for a rug like this. Love to see what it looks like unfolded. Yes, I am sad to say that over the years I have probably acquired all the rugs I need. Not all the rugs I want by any stretch of the imagination, but all the rugs I need. Um, because I look at the rugs over at Lutz's with with great lust in my heart, because some of them are just so nice. And you can't go to a store and buy anything even close to that quality for the same money. If you go out to a store and you say, I have $500 in my pocket and I'm going to buy a room size rug. Well, you have to know if you've priced rugs lately, that that's going to get you the bottom end of the rug. It's it's not going to be a, a nice top of the line rug. And if you have $500 in your pocket and you go to Lutz's, you're going to get a really, really nice rug. Yes, it's not going to be brand new, but hey, who wants a brand new rug? Ask anyone and they'll tell you vintage or antique oriental rugs are the way to go. So I love looking at their rugs. At some point, when I when I can catch Stacy in an indulgent mood, I will ask her if I can unroll one of these rugs, just so you can see an example of the quality they have. It's just, just really breathtaking stuff. So I was very glad to even get that little bit of filming. But you can see, even from you know, uh, the amount of filming I can do on a rolled up rug, you can see how really beautiful it is. And I'm sure you can just imagine what it would look like in the middle of your living room, because I know I can. All right, next up, this was a really, really interesting little piece. And in addition to large pieces, uh, you know, furniture, because that's their specialty, furniture, they have these really unusual and, and rare pieces. And this particular folk art piece is, is one such. So let's take a look. Okay, folk art doll's house, 225. So let's back up so I can get the whole thing in. And let's take a look at this. We've got a little porch. I'm not sure. 
Well, it doesn't seem to open, so I think it was intended to be just viewed from the outside. But look at this. Got little shades and curtains in the windows. Very, very interesting piece. So this is obviously a, a dollhouse. It's, it's a small piece. I would say it's probably about maybe oh, 12 to 18 inches tall and maybe about two feet wide. It's not what we think of as a dollhouse where you open it up and you stick the furniture in and the dolls. It's, uh, it's sort of a small miniature house. Very nice. These primitive dollhouses, they're, they're one of a kind. They're obviously homemade pieces. They have a very strong collector's market. And people will pay serious money for these houses. I have seen them go in the thousands. And they're, they're just wonderful. Uh, what you would do with this, obviously, is you would not hand it off to a child, but it would be a, a decorative piece in your home, um, you know, like a work of art, a sculpture, something for people to come in and look at. And I just thought that one was so interesting. And again, and I've said this many times, you want to find weird stuff, you go to Lutz, because you're going to see stuff there you just won't see anywhere else. Uh, by the way, we have another you won't see anywhere else piece coming up later. All right. Next up, this is a cast iron mantle and, and fireplace surround. I think technically it would be called a fireplace surround uh, because it's just the top that is the mantle. So let's take. All right, let's take a look at this. Uh, reclaimed Edwardian Art Nouveau cast iron bedroom fireplace, and apparently there's a signature up here somewhere. Very, very tiny. Let's go down here and look at the price. 265. That's an awfully good deal for this. But the fireplace it probably comes up uh, about to my waist, and I'm going to say that this little mantle ledge is only about three feet across. Gorgeous, teeny tiny piece. Pieces like this are wonderful because they are perfect for smaller homes, smaller apartments, condominiums. I do love that, that's really nice. And of course, the fact that it's cast iron means it can be stripped down and repainted with very little trouble at all. Now these wonderful little pieces were around uh, 100, 150 years ago. They were common. Um, they were in small bedrooms. They, they would be in hallways or alcoves, anywhere you needed a little bit of heat. So the thing that's great about these small bedrooms pieces is that you can put them into modern homes uh, that may not be large, that may have smaller rooms. You can put them in apartments, condominiums. They're wonderful. Um, and there was a time, of course, that almost any room in your house that people did any living in, bedrooms, kitchens, living rooms, dining rooms, they all had to have a fireplace because there was no central heating. If you didn't have a fireplace, you would have had a stove in there that you would have had to have had some source of heat. And I thought that little piece was great. It's a very good price. And it is the sort of thing that I think is well worth the purchase. And then strip it down. Ordinarily, by the way, they were painted. It was cast iron and you didn't usually have just the naked cast iron in your home. Ordinarily, it would have been painted, and it might have been faux finished as well. That little fireplace around to me would be the perfect piece to do a little faux finishing if you wanted to experiment with marbleizing or wood graining. Um, great piece, because that's very much how they were done. Um, although, I have to say, often they would just be painted to match the color of the trim in the room.
Uh, I think they're stupendous. And you just don't see very many of them anymore. We see a lot of them here on the East Coast. You see them a lot in Europe because they, well, they had more homes uh, back in the day than we did. You know, we in the United States, we were just sort of beginning our home building phase and they had homes everywhere, pre-existing homes. So you do see more of them in Europe. I still think they're wonderful little pieces, and I wouldn't mind eventually getting one of those. I'd have to find a place for it. See, that's my problem. I want everything I see, but I'm aware of the fact that I don't have room for it, which is about the only thing that separates me from your classical hoarder. Ah, next up. This is uh, a Victorian sideboard or buffet. Okay, let's take a look at this. This is what I would call a classic piece of Victorian styling. The marble top, the pediment here, this, this just screams Victorian. And even though throughout most of the period uh, that we associate with Victorian furniture, you can tease out individual styles, Eastlake, Gothic Revival, etc. This one is Victorian. I think that's what comes to everyone's mind when they think of the word. Beautiful piece. Oh, 365, did I mention that? One of the reasons I wanted to show this piece is because when we think of Victorian, we're talking about a huge space of time from the 1830s right up to uh, the turn of the century. So it's like 70 years and we're moving into the modern era. So furnishings were changing constantly. This was an unusually active period for furniture change, yet we have one word that we slap on 70 years of this. And it can be, it can be very misleading. Um, I will look at pieces uh, from the Victorian period and I find myself saying, well, that's Gothic Revival, that's Eastlake. Well, that's sort of Victorian Rococo and, you know, all of these little sort of subcategories. But this particular piece had most of the classic Victorian elements in it. It had that wonderful, wonderful marble top, and the big chunky pediment on top, the carving on the cabinet doors. Really, really nice. And that is one of the few purely Victorian pieces I've seen lately. By the way, the others have all been at Lutz's too. I go to other places, I, I just don't see the variety of styles I see at Lutz. So this one was just a sweet piece. I also like the fact that it's small. Most Victorian furniture was quite large, especially in terms of the case pieces, the, uh, the sideboards, the cabinets, the buffets, the consoles. They're big, heavy, huge pieces. And then you got to chairs and the chairs were small and delicate and fragile and you're afraid to sit in them. So this was nice because it's a sideboard, but it's, it's scaled beautifully for modern living. So I thought that one was terrific. Now, oh, next up, and this is for those of you who have medieval fantasies. Here we go. Okay, here we have a pair of stained glass windows. Um, it says they were custom made. They have hooks on the top, so obviously they were hanging in front of other windows. And the subject matter is the knight and the damsel fair. Nicely routed panels here. Beautiful piece, both of them. Um, 595. 
So that's approximately $300 per panel. Not bad. Again, typical of these sort of oddball pieces that Lutz gets in there. These were modern. This, these are not old pieces. And it's the knight in shining armor and the fair damsel in distress. It's just, it's like you've got your whole sort of Grimm's fairy tale wrapped up in these two stained glass windows. Very, very interesting pieces. It, I looked at them carefully to see if they were windows or doors, but I couldn't see any indication that they had been installed in anything like a window casing or a cabinet as a door. Um, they did have the hooks uh, on top so that you could suspend them in front of a window. And it's possible they were actually made for that purpose. However, over the years, I've seen a lot of stained glass windows that have been remade. In other words, they've been taken out of the original frames. New frames have been made for them so they could be used in different ways. So I'm reluctant to say they never had a previous life. I, I have a feeling that they didn't. I have a feeling they were always intended to be freestanding pieces. But again, knowing that so many stained glass pieces were in fact remade like this, I wouldn't want to go out on a limb and say that was the case here. But it's just really interesting pieces, and I thought you might like a chance to see those. Um, and let's see. Okay, this is, in fact, uh, the last piece we're going to take a look at today. This is one of those pieces. Notice the piece on top. Really serious, oddball pieces. What we're looking at is we are looking at the modern uh, interpretation of an empire dresser. So take a look. This piece has been here for a while, but I haven't filmed it because every time I've come by, my attention has been caught by the baby coffin on top. This is a lovely empire-style piece. Uh, mahogany, and it's, it's a modern interpretation of empire which is why you are seeing things that are combined in unusual ways. Uh, these sort of fake columns were a feature of Empire Furniture. Uh, notice that the top drawer, see if I can get my finger in there so you can see it. The top drawer extends over the bottom drawers, which we already know to be a feature of Empire Furniture. Uh, mahogany, which was one of their favorite woods. Um, did I mention 225? Well, if I didn't, I'm mentioning it now. But this was made by a modern cabinet maker. In other words, not uh, an empire cabinet maker from 1810. This was probably made a good 150 years later. Beautiful piece of furniture. Really lovely. And for 225, that is a huge, huge bargain. Ugh. You know, every time I come into this store, I, I just... It really sort of scratches my acquisitive urge. And I always walk out feeling so very covetous. Um, because I really want absolutely everything. That's one I want. Mm. There are a lot of ways we can tell this is a modern piece. For one thing, it's a little smaller and a little lighter than most empire pieces like this. Most of them would have been bureaus. They would have been taller. They would have gone up uh, four or five feet. Uh, big, heavy. Um, the empire furniture, well, some of it anyway, the bureaus in particular, had a tendency to look very 
substantial. They were going for a heavy, solid, firm look. Um, in other words, getting away from a lighter, delicate look. Not to say they, did, they didn't have light, delicate empire pieces. They most certainly did. In particular, some of the Egyptian empire pieces were especially delicate. And so now that I brought Egyptian empire into it, the empire pieces got their name from Napoleon and the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon's army was attempting to take over the world, the Napoleonic Empire. And they were fighting everywhere. They, they were fighting in Egypt. And they were bringing back pieces of furniture as war booty. But also they were bringing back the ideas of, of pieces of furniture. So you would see styles. Uh, Egyptian Empire in particular is just beautiful, beautiful stuff. There are some absolutely gorgeous pieces of Egyptian Empire furniture in the White House, and I think they were brought back by James Madison. He, he had to refurnish the White House after the fire in the War of 1812, and he went to France, got a whole bunch of stuff to restock the White House, including a lot of Empire furniture, because this is the right period. Empire furniture, the heyday, was around 1820, and of course, you know, the War of 1812, you get the connection. So he brought back some gorgeous stuff from France. That's why in, in the U.S., you know, our nation's capital building is very heavily influenced by French design. And Jackie Kennedy did a fabulous job of restoring it. So, and, and of course, those of you who have followed the channel know that I just, I worship Jackie Kennedy. When I was a little kid, I wanted to be her when I grew up. That was my role model. I wanted to be Jackie Kennedy. And then two years later, I wanted to be Emma Peel. So, I know, TMI. But the Egyptian Empire is is much lighter than these heavy case pieces. And we do have some in the White House. So if you want to see top of the line empire furniture, take a trip to DC. Now, perhaps you notice that coffin on top of the empire um, little dresser there. That is in fact a child's coffin. That is not a salesman's sample. And this is very creepy for a lot of people, but it's important to remember that a hundred years ago, 150 years ago, um, we had a, a high infant mortality rate. That's just the way things were. Our grandparents, our great grandparents, they buried their children. It's, it's a sad reality of life. And children's coffins were an everyday thing for people of that era. So it's small wonder that we would eventually see children's coffins. A lot of people will say, oh no, that's a salesman's sample. No, it's not. A salesman's sample would have been a scale model of an adult coffin. But a child's coffin would have been short but wider. You know, for, sadly, somebody's fat little baby. And the scale in that coffin was child size. So, for those of you who find this sort of thing creepy, desperately sorry, but unfortunately, it was a fact of life. And when you're going to deal with antiques, antique furniture, eventually, you are going to come across the fact that they were much more inured to death than we were. For them, it was part of life. It was commonplace. But for us, with our improved mortality rates, our lifespan that's twice what they would have hoped for. Um, I, I read something, trying to remember where I read it, and I can't. It's not coming to me. Um, but it was uh, some historical work that in uh, the period of colonial America, you were not likely to know your grandparents. You just weren't. That uh, 
it just wasn't going to happen. You would be lucky if you, you had your own parents through adulthood. So, as I say, dealing with old stuff, you get the bad with the good. So, that's what I have for you today from Lutz Antiques. I have, and I mentioned this before, I have stockpiled just huge amounts of film because whenever I go there, I try to catch everything new and their stock turns all the time. So invariably, I end up with a lot more footage than I could ever throw into a single video. And I tuck it away so that I can take it out and share it with you. We've had snow this week, meaning shopping is not as easy as it was. So um, that film, and by the way, that was taken in the middle of the summer. Uh, and you can see from the way the light was creeping in the windows. Oh, yeah. So that's what we've got. Um, meantime, take a look at the Sumi's Angels Facebook page. The giveaways are still going on. I just recently went out and got a whole stack of boxes for our pen giveaways. And Colleen from the Sumi's Angels got me even more boxes. So we're probably going to have to get more pens. So giveaways going on. Go on over, check it out. Meantime, we are going to take a look at a little slideshow on our way out. Have a terrific day, everyone. I will see you tomorrow where we are going to pick up on the Egyptian lamp project we started last week and hopefully finish it off. I'll see you then. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.